Hey, I'm Debbie, and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you're here, and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Well, good morning again. That was a little better than the first time, wasn't it? Um, special little time today, so uh, thank you for being part of that with us. Um, my name is uh, Pastor Johnson, Randy Johnson. It, it's kind of intriguing with names. I didn't even ask them on the history of the name Sawyer and how they choose a name. A, a number of you have had the privilege or responsibility of naming someone, right? And you thought through the names and you thought about family names and it could even be maiden names involved there somehow or middle names. And, but you also thought about I'm not naming the child because of this person on the playground when I was a kid. We will not use them. Somebody says, well, what about this? No, we're not going there. No, just not using that name. But for my, my first name is Randy. I've mentioned that in high school. My initials started being used by some friends. It was just RJ. And then um, I got into ministry my second year of college, and it became Pastor Johnson because they didn't want the students referring to you by first name. And, um, and then Pastor J, and then... I, I received my first doctorate in 1990, and uh, yes, yeah, so I'm old. I know that's what that tells you, but it tells you something else. I received my first doctorate in distance learning before there was internet. So think about that for a moment, right? They would mail me cassette tapes of the classroom lectures, and I would mail in my papers. Is that fun? So, but then it became Dr. Johnson. And then immediately it became Dr. J. And I'm sure you see the resemblance there, right? Yes, Dr. J. I love that. For a while it became Dirge. I had a group of students who called me Dirge. D-R-J, Dirge. And it made total sense for them. And then it's just of recent become Doc. And so the, the names of where things go and, and how that happens. And so I, I still have... Some kids um, who call me Pastor Jay. You know, one of them just turned 50 yesterday. <laughs> it's just it's like, oh wow, <laughs> you feel that. Uh, you, for some of you, you, you have the name because of a title for something. And um, you know, for, for myself, it, it has been coach. Some people just call me coach or prof, professor, or again, Pastor, we're, we're going to be going into some titles of Jesus, names for Jesus as we go into this month. We're going to really focus on one verse. It's going to be Isaiah 9-6. And so for this week and the next three weeks, I'm going to be focusing on Isaiah 9-6. And then on the 31st, Sawyer's dad's going to speak. And so Nathan, our kids director, is going to be speaking. And so... Um, Billy Sunday, and I referenced him two weeks ago, and I put out a challenge, and I watched last week's message, and, and Chris, you did a fabulous job with it, but weren't you going to, like, run the auditorium and slide into the... No, I, I mentioned about... Remember, Billy Sunday was the Detroit... Or no, excuse me, the York Yankee second baseman who became an evangelist. But I want to share this quote that he gave. He said, there are 256 names given the Bible for the Lord Jesus Christ. 256 names. And I suppose this was because he was infinitely beyond all that any one name could express. And so as we go into looking at the names of Jesus that have been given for him and just getting a better feel for it. So Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 is where we're going to be landing. And uh, for most of my verses, they will be up on the screen, but you're more than welcome to follow along if you would like to. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The book of Isaiah is in the Old Testament. Um, it was written by Isaiah about 700 B.C., 700 years before Christ, we have this book written. He's going to be describing a lot of things of the future. It's an interesting book because we know that our Bible has 66 books in it. Isaiah has 66 chapters. We know that our Bible, the first 39 books of it, we call the Old Testament. And then the other 27 are the New Testament. For Isaiah, the first 39 chapters talk about judgment. And as you've studied the Old Testament, you may have thought about the law and the judgment of God. But the last 27 chapters talk about blessing, grace, and hope. It's interesting that the word salvation appears some 26 times in Isaiah. Salvation. And the name Isaiah even means the Lord saves. One of the things I really appreciate of the book of Isaiah is what's called messianic prophecy. And I know, intimidating phrase, and we'll just let Chris explain it on Wednesday, but no, the um, <laughs> messianic prophecy, let's take the word prophecy. We know it's about speaking about the future. So we have speaking about the future. Messianic, let's just take the root word of it, Messiah. It's speaking about the future of who the Messiah will be, what he will look like, what he will do. And it's amazing that 700 years before the Messiah that we know is Jesus comes, it's being described with certain titles. The one I want to focus on today is that very first one, the Wonderful Counselor. Matthews, Chavlaz, and Walton in the IVP Bible background commentary said, in Egypt... It was a formal, time-honored practice to bestow a title of five names on a pharaoh ascending to the throne as part of the ascension ceremony. And so there are some who look at this and they're like, so is it talking about the Messiah being wonderful, comma, counselor, comma, mighty God, comma, everlasting father, comma, prince of peace? Was it five titles that the culture would have understood, here is royalty they're talking about. When the Messiah comes, we, as, we obviously know him as the king of kings. So is he a wonderful counselor or a wondrous counselor? And I don't think it really matters that much, do you? Because <laughs> I think he's both. Rylanick and Spencer in the Moody Bible Commentary said the word wonderful stands in Epexegetical construct. So basically, the grammar of it to counselor would be translated a wonder of a counselor or a wonder counselor. Moyer in the Tyndale Old Testament commentary said, He's a wonder of a counselor. It is the nearest word Hebrew has to the idea of supernatural. 700 years earlier, talking about this one who's going to come. This Messiah, that he is going to be supernatural, he is God. It's interesting because I look at these titles and I see that for next week we'll talk about him being mighty God, the deity of the Messiah, the deity of Jesus. Jesus is God. But I really don't have to go that far to get there because right before that I have that he is the wondrous, the wonderful one, which talks about him being God. Let's look at this word wonderful. Spence Jones in the pulpit commentary speaks as wonderful as the Messiah would be wonderful in his nature as a God-man, in his teaching which astonished those who heard it, in his doings, in the circumstances of his birth and death, in his resurrection, that's definitely wondrous, and his ascension. We have nine locations, and I can be pretty sure that in all of the other eight locations, they're going to reference this next verse from Isaiah. It's Isaiah 28, 29. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. 
He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. It's beautiful that to know that the Lord, obviously he's all-knowing. He's excellent in wisdom. But he doesn't just have the wisdom. He's giving counsel. He's willing to share it with us. Derek Kidner in the New Bible Commentary says, Wonderful regularly means supernatural. I don't know if some of you may like the whole superheroes or the Marvel series and thinking about what, you know, what their um, strength would be. And if you were, I mean, you, some of you probably even, not as much over here, but probably more over here, have even processed through um, what strength would I like to have if I was a superhero. And, and here it's talking about the Messiah's super strength as being a counselor of wisdom, of giving advice. Going back to the Moody Bible commentary, it says, extraordinary to the point of being miraculous. John Martin in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, which you referenced last week, which I appreciate that commentary because it was partially, it's very succinct commentary, but it's done by the Dallas Theological Seminary professors, which I know a lot of them personally. But he references this word of wonderful as exceptional, distinguished. As I was going through this and, and looking at the wonderful in counselor, a Bible story came up and you'll know parts of the story. No matter what your church background basically is, you've probably heard of this guy named Samson, and the, the strongest man, right? And, and when you think of all the, the feats that he did in Judges chapter 13 through 16, but there's a situation before he's born. And it talks about the Lord appearing to Manoah, his father. And I want to step back for a moment because when it talks about the Lord coming, it references him as the angel of the Lord. Now, in Scripture, we will have an angel of the Lord comes, and that could be Gabriel. It could just be different Michael, the archangel. It could be a different angel. But when it talks of the angel of the Lord, the technical term for that is a Christophany. And I know like some of you like those technical terms. Some of you are like, why did you even share that? But it's just what it means is it's an appearance of the Lord, an appearance of Jesus before he was even born. We're going to be celebrating Christmas. This is not when Jesus was created or started to exist. Jesus is God. He always has been, he is, and he forever will be. As a matter of fact, in Colossians 1, we know that Jesus was involved with creation because all things were created by him and for him. But now let me go back to Manoah. And the Lord is having this conversation with him about the son he's going to have. And the son's going to be a deliverer for the people. But I, I want you to do three things for him. I, I don't want you ever to cut his hair. He shouldn't drink any strong wine. And he shouldn't touch anything dead. And if you know his story, there's a, there's a lot of things that go on there and you, you learn a lot about him with it. But when we get to Judges 13, 18, and the angel of the Lord, which we know is Jesus, said to him, why do you ask my name? seeing it is wonderful. When Manoah saw the Lord, he's like, who are you? And he's like, seriously? You know I'm God. I'm miraculous. I'm wonderful. I'm supernatural. I am God. And it ends the conversation. You, you, you end the conversation with a question, which is, which is so positive. When I think of the Lord being wonderful, you quoted someone last week, which I really appreciated your quote because it's been rattling around in my brain this week. You were saying that um, God being in heaven and, and everything being perfect, right? What would it take for him to want to leave heaven? What would it be 
that would take Jesus out of heaven to come to earth? Do you remember the answer on that? It's us. Do you understand that? Have you, have, have, have you processed that? That God loves you so much that he left perfection to come to something that's definitely not perfect around here? That he left heaven to come to earth so that we have the opportunity to leave earth and go to heaven? That as we come to this Christmas season and we're focusing on Jesus coming and his birth, I don't want to skip months. I don't want to click forward and pass by some months, but we we immediately need to go to Good Friday and to Easter and realize why he came. To experience this all things like us, be tempted in all ways, but yet without sin. So he can be the perfect sacrifice for us in our place for our sin. Because of our sin, our relationship with God has been broken. So Jesus comes to to repair that, to put the offer. I'm going to let you know that God is the ultimate gentleman. He could just grab us and make us go to heaven, as if that'd be a horrible thing, by the way. But he said he lays it out there for you. He makes it obvious to us there is a God by creation. Through the word, we know who Jesus is and that God is willing to have a relationship with us. Did you capture that? God is willing and wants to have a relationship with us. So Jesus comes, pays the price for our sin. Yeah, he died, but he rose again. He is alive. That gets us to Easter, right? He is alive and he's offering us life to the full. Life with purpose, value, and meaning. Wow, he is wonderful. Gary Smith in the New American Commentary said, Wonderful Counselor combines the idea of doing something wonderful, extraordinary, miraculous, with the skill of giving wise advice, making plans, counsel. Wonderful Counselor. Let's look at the word counselor. Moody Bible Commentary just says very basically, one who advises, who serves as a consultant to help and lead others. We we have the idea of what a counselor is, right? We've we've either been involved in counseling or been to a counselor or need to go to a counselor. One one of those things, correct? And so Bertram and Tucker in the, catch this title, this one, The Preacher's Complete Homiletic Commentary. I don't know why I looked at other commentaries when this is the complete one, but that's beside the point, right? But his quote goes, How does an earthly friend help us in such a case? By producing a certain impression on our mind. A a counselor is one who helps us with our thinking. I love that from Proverbs 23, 7, the New King James Version says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. For as a man thinks, so is he. I've coached numerous sports for new... I've looked at it one time, I had to list them out for something, you know, it was, I've coached over 50 seasons of sports, it's not over 50 years, don't make me that old yet, but, but over 50 seasons, but one of the things I would regularly do is, something would happen that I didn't agree with, and I'd call a player over, and I would say, what were you thinking? And I tried to say it in a nice way, I didn't like, what were you thinking, you know, like that, you know, what were you thinking? First of all, they may have a great thought that I didn't think about, and they may be teaching me, right? We're lifelong learners, right? Be teachable. But the other thing was, I wanted to hear what they were thinking, because if I could change their thinking, I could change their actions. I didn't want to just change their actions. I wanted them to think differently. That's what God does for us. The transforming of our minds, affecting our thinking should affect our actions. So you might be saying, how can I set an appointment with this counselor called God? I I think there's three different ways that I'm going to share today, okay? The first one is, I think God speaks through others. God speaks through others. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. 
I have a friend who recently had a, a big opportunity in front of him, and he didn't feel that it was the right thing, but yet he processed it through with others and thinking of what their thoughts were and just making sure what he was thinking made sense and processing it, talking to others. And I know the love in this room. I know, I don't know it totally. I see it. But the connections here are so strong. Please, please do not walk alone in your journey. Obviously rely on the Lord, but you have other people he's placed around you to come alongside you. God speaks through others. Solomon writes in Proverbs 8, 14, I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. If you know the life of Solomon, you're like, yeah, it's easy for you to say. God gave you that wisdom. However, I want you to process this for yourself. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. If you've given your life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit indwells you. God himself is in you. You have something to offer. Please be willing to speak into the life of others. Speak love into their life. That love may be harsh at times or words of encouragement, but be willing to speak into the life of others. The second one I wrote down for this wonderful counselor is God speaks through our conscience, the Holy Spirit, and the still quiet voice. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 and 12, I'm not having these verses put up. It's only two verses, but it's, they're longer verses. I want you, for those of you who are artistic, you probably already do this, but I want you just to paint this picture in your mind as you're going through it. For those of us who aren't as visual of thinkers, try to capture this moment. And what has happened is Elijah, a prophet of God, a man of God, has gone and spoken against the king. And the king's wife's name is Jezebel. One of those names we're probably not going to be naming children anytime soon, right? But, um, but you have this Jezebel and she wants to kill Elijah and he runs and, and he feels like he's all alone. He's like, God, it's, it's only you know, you and me, and sometimes I wonder about you, you know, and it's just like, I'm, I'm all alone, and he's, and he's getting into a very dark place, and, he, and he's reaching out, wanting God's counsel. And now, capture this, please. And God said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And be, behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. I can imagine if I'm standing up against this, and things are, my, my drawing of him has him kind of fearing away a little bit, just bracing himself. Everything's breaking apart. It goes about, and after the wind, an earthquake, and so now he's unstable, right? And, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. I, I'm, I'm in, like Sagano's in my mind right now, and you know, the, the flames coming up from the, the Japanese restaurant, the, the table. Like just, you know, you're going back and, and then the fire goes off and it's like, but the Lord is not the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. All of us want to hear from God, I believe. I'm going to tell you this month might be the hardest month to hear from God. With all the plans going out, the running around, and a lot of good things going on. I'm not saying they're bad things. But we get so caught up in commotion that we forget that Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. A time where we're just to be still. I have friends who, a number of friends who hunt. Some do that with a camera. <laughs> Some will go out and I remember my for my dad and I going out bow hunting and his first time out he grabbed his arrow and went through it and all of a sudden he heard a bing. It was so dark he couldn't see what it was. You all know it probably happened, right? He cut the bowstring accidentally. So for the next three hours he just sat in the tree and just enjoyed nature. Do you enjoy nature? 
Do you take time just to go away? Maybe for some of you, it's a, you don't want to go to nature, you're just not sure about that, but a walk. Taking, taking a walk. And maybe for some of us, it's with our car. We just need to turn off the sounds. Let it be quiet. Scripture even talks about what? Getting into a closet. Getting away from everything. Do you want to hear from God? And I think your answer is, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty good, actually. He's not speaking in, typically in all the commotion that he's speaking in that quiet time together. David in Psalm 16, 7 says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. He's laying down at night. And we think of prayer, of talking to God, but prayer is a conversation, so shouldn't there be him talking to us and just listening to him. If you're getting counsel from others, or if you think you've heard something from God, I want to put a parameter on it first of all, okay? And it's James 3.17. It says, but the wisdom from above is first pure. It's pure. Then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. God's never going to ask you or counsel you to do wrong in order the good will come about. With me on that? He, he works in perfection. He's always wanting you to do the right thing. And then the last one, the third one is, obviously God speaks through his word. And God speaks through his word, so I'm hoping you're spending time in the word. If you want a little fun project, go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is 176 verses long. It is the length of the book of Philippians or the book of James. And it's one chapter in the Old Testament, Psalm 119. It's an interesting one. I had somebody recently ask me that said, do you think it would help me understand Psalms if I knew Hebrew? And I'm like, well, Psalms is all poetry. As soon as, with any language, as soon as you change to another language with poetry, you, especially like a rhyme or something special with it, you lose a lot of what's intended in that poetry. So what they do with Psalm 119, the writer went ahead and broke it into 22 sections of eight verses each. The Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. And so for the first eight letters, he started with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So for, for our process, we would say the first eight verses all start with letter A, the next eight verses all start with the letter B. I was reading the commentator and he said, he thinks, he just throws it out there for us, is this the way David taught Solomon the alphabet and about life? As you go through Psalm 119, and again, it's 176 verses long, it's going to use all kinds of synonyms for the Bible, for the Word of God, for the law, for precepts, Statutes, judgments, commandments, testimonies. Actually, and I've done this a number of times, and you, and you guys might have fun with this when you're the Monday Night Ladies group or with the Wednesday Night group, of go through Psalm 119 and just underline those synonyms for the word. And you're probably going to find there's only five verses that don't have a synonym for the word. 171 verses are going to reference the Bible. Psalm 119, 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, if it comes down to getting counsel from God, he's going to counsel us in righteousness, right? Psalm 119, verse 18, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of your law. As you go into the word to pray, God, show me something special. Show me something wondrous. Psalm 119, 24. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. This book is my counselor where I go. I'm sure that hearing a little bit of your journey in that, for a number of you, you've been in a situation where You've been struggling with something, you go to the Word and you've found an answer for what you were struggling with. Or the other one is, you've spent time in the Word and then later that day you're like, oh my goodness, I was just reading about this this morning. 
and how the Bible relates to us today. It's, it's living, it's alive. And then Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He's not being redundant there. A lamp and a light. I, I know for myself that we've, we have um, had golden retrievers. And so taking them out at night, we have woods around us where we live, even though it's Auburn Hills. There are woods there, believe it or not, in some areas. But um, we, uh, if I'm taking the dog out at night, I want to watch where I'm stepping, if that makes sense. Those of you who have dogs, and especially larger dogs, know what I'm talking about. But we also have skunks in the area, so I'd like to know a distance. All right, the stink and the stink I want to avoid. How about in life? There are times where I need the word just for my next step. Just what I'm going through today, this week, this season. But I also want the counsel from God long term looking at the future and going further with it. Joshua 1.8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. You can take a study on this if you'd like, but the word prosperous, do a word study, and you're going to find that the word prosperous in Scripture is always associated with meditating on the word. Now, when you think of prosperous, you might be thinking of something different. You might be thinking of finances. I'm talking about something much more valuable than finances and God providing in so many ways, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And so we meditate. That word meditate um, in the Hebrew is a concept of actually a cow chewing and just constantly chewing and then, I don't know, sorry, but regurgitating, chewing again. And then the cow does that kind of thing. But it's just that, that idea of chewing on something through the day. That we, we read the word. We, we listen to the word. And then we just process it. And work through it. And let it work through our life. Ken Hughes and Ortland have the God Save Sinners commentary. And they said, his wonderful counselor, he has the best ideas and strategies Let's follow him. As I close off with this, I think we do need to realize that God is the creator. He has the best plans. You are made on purpose for a purpose. And therefore, a Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that the trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. It's the idea of trusting the Lord. If you haven't trusted in the Lord, let today be the day of salvation for you. Let be, today be the day where you're like, I can't do this on my own. I messed this up. God, I need you. I know I've sinned and don't deserve heaven. Don't deserve a relationship with you, but I want that. Would you please come into my life? Thank you for dying for my sin but also rising again, being alive, offering me eternal life and life to the full. It's turning from following myself. The word repent is in the Bible. Turning from following myself and following him, giving him my life. A very basic conversation with God that just says, I know I've messed up. You have the answer. I need you. Please save me. And I encourage you to add something. Thank you for saving me. Take him at his word. He says, for those of us who call upon the name of the Lord, we will be saved. For those who have given their life to the Lord, James 1.5 is so fun. James 1.5 is... Um, it... it it hits me so, so strongly. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, I qualify. Often in life, I qualify. Yeah, I, 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 one other person with me. Okay, the rest of you, you just, this is just between us, Christine, okay? Just the two of us. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, 
who gives generously to all without reproach and will be given to him. There's a lot there. I don't know if you've, you've probably heard the verse before, but maybe you've let it slip by too quickly. If you ask God for wisdom, it says he gives generously. He doesn't like just give you a little bit. He gives generously. It, it could be very easy for him to just give you just enough for right now so it forces you to come back. We should want to come back. He gives generously. And then we later have to think through, do we keep coming back even when we don't need him, right? But then catch the next phrase. Next phrase. Without reproach. Have you ever gone to ask somebody for some advice and you wish you wouldn't have? And they just belittled you? And it's like, oh, yeah, I'm thankful I asked for that. Note to self, never again. God, the all-knowing one, the wonderful counselor, says, you need, some, you need some advice? Come to me. Oh, I have it for you. I want to share it with you. And I won't mock you. I love you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can call you Father. And you are a good, good Father. We thank you for your love. I pray that if there's somebody here who does not know you, that today would be the day of salvation. If there's somebody who's participating online who doesn't know you, that they would reach out to us or they would just have a conversation with you right now, giving their life to you. For those who know you but have not been following you, that today they would rededicate their life. And for those who know you and have been faithful, may they be willing to speak into the lives of others, listening to you and speaking to others. We thank you for Nathan and Erica and for little Sawyer. Father, we again pray that you would um, not only work on the hearts of the people here, our hearts, but also in his heart that at an early age he would know his need for you and, and follow you and, and lead others for you. Father, we thank you for your love. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.